I don't know if you're aware of it, but um, you know, as we in our recent years have adopted the seasons of the church year, the season of Lent is 40 days long. But what is not counted in those 40 days are Sundays. Sunday is always a day of resurrection. And so some of the scriptures are going to talk about the fact of resurrection before we get to the actual Easter event in celebrating new life in Christ. Such is the case today. It makes me a little grumpy because I've got to do resurrection things more and more often. But that's what it's being like as a resurrection people. So today we're going to talk some about resurrection. And the two passages that we were given to reflect upon are both resurrection passages. That wonderful, that wonderful story from the 37th chapter of Ezekiel where there's this valley of bones, dim bones, dim bones, dim dry bones, you know, the foot bones connected to the head bone or something like that. Um, eventually, yeah. Through the leg bone, the knee bone, the hip bone, the, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, good job, choir, on the anthem. Um, and, and as you see in that passage, you know, new life occurs, but it occurs it, to tell a story. You see, what was going on in the story of Ezekiel is that the people, it, it relates the time when the people of Israel were taken away in the Babylonian captivity from the promised land. And they, were, they had rebelled against the king of Babylon. They refused to pay him tribute. And therefore, he came in and he conquered Jerusalem and the, and the states of Judea, Judah and Israel. And he took all the people, or all the leadership at least, back to Babylon. That was standard practice in the time that if somebody rebels against you, you break them up. It happened several centuries later to the people of Israel again. When the Roman arm, when they revolted against Rome, and what happened then was that they were they were forcibly conquered, and they were taken and spread out all through the Roman Empire. It was called the diaspora. So Israel was used to getting clobbered that way, but it's something you never really get used to. And so Ezekiel is reflecting upon that and this particular passage that addresses the concern of what are the people what about the people that die away from the promised land and the spirit of god takes ezekiel into this valley of bones and he says look what you see here and he says proclaim to them and it's my word and ezekiel does and then they go into the they they begin all these bones are put together back into bodies and flesh comes onto the bodies the sinews as it's called but no life yet. And God pro tells him to, tells Ezekiel to proclaim again, to put the breath, and he proclaimed to the breath, the new, to, to have breath into the bodies. And then he explains, these are the people of Israel. And what the passage is, is it's a promise for those who have died far away from the promised land, that they would be recovered, re they would be cherished, they would be brought home. Where we in Christianity talk about the importance of eternal life and resurrection life, the important thing in Judaism is the home, the land, the promised land. Um, such to the point that over the 3,700 years, Judaism has been a part of human culture. And ever since that first Passover event, from time and time and time, that the people of Israel have been broken up and spread about around the world. And... Let's, in terms of the Jewish Hebrew people of today, there's very little genetic connection between them and the, and the Hebrew people of New Testament times because most of them came out of a different set of cir cultural circumstances. Nevertheless, every time they had a Passover meal over the centuries, it always ended with the words, next year in Jerusalem. And then back in 1948, what had been a promise or a hope turned into reality with the reestablishment of the secular nation of Israel. And, of course, the fights have been going on ever since. But nevertheless, what the Hebrew people have now is a fulfillment of that promise that they can always now go to a Jerusalem, their promised land, 
has been re-fulfilled and re-established. Now, what does this say about resurrection and God's promises? First of, the, first of all, I want to point out that the dead people, you know, the, the, the people in the valley were dead. Death and life is part of our daily struggle. We wrestle with whether we each day, my appropriate question is, how much am I going to be alive today? How much am I going to take on the challenges of life and living? Or am I going to kind of deaden myself and hide and retreat? The tough thing about being dead is that it's deteriorative and it's static. Nothing ever changes except, deter except more deterioration. And the, so the bones, when they are lying there in the valley, there's not much to them. They're just bones. They are but a memory of life that had gone on before. We in the life of the body of Christ are challenged daily whether we're going to be a people of life or a people of death. The challenge of the church today, an incredible cultural challenge is that, you know, churches are dying on the vine. I heard this last week of a, of a, of a church in central Iowa that I used to go to minister meetings at that back in the 1980s was thriving and doing well, and they're closing their doors on April 23rd. And what we have to figure out and wrestle with in, as, as God's Spirit gives us is how alive are we in the body of Christ going to be? How alive are we going to make it? The old, the old, there's the old phrase, the church is always two de two a church is always two generations away from closing. And that's true of the Christian church in Ottumwa, Iowa this week. So the challenge in the midst of us is how alive are we going to be? It's a personal challenge individually, and it's a challenge to ask ourselves each day. It's also a challenge for the community. How alive are we going to be? The Word of God came to Ezekiel, and Ezekiel spoke it, and the, the bones were reformed, and they grew flesh upon them, but they did not have life. And so God... Ezekiel was told by God to proclaim to the breath of the winds that come around and breathe new life into the bodies of the people of Israel, and he did that. And so what happened is, is the people came alive, and the promise was refulfilled, and they were able to return home at the end of days. So it's not just a matter of us deciding how alive or dead we're going to be because ultimately it depends on whether or not we let God's Spirit into our midst. Church, we in the church, you know, it's really strange how we deal with the Holy Spirit. It is really strange. We prefer not to because the Holy Spirit challenges us and is unpredictable and moves us in ways that we don't want to go. It takes us away from those sorts of things that we find comforting and comfortable. But if the Spirit is not in our midst, what we have is no life. That's kind of strange, isn't it? It feels scary. And yet, even in the traditions of the church, as we go through the church, you know, we have a season of Advent, a season of Christmas, you know, that observes the birth a season of Lent that observes the ministry of Jesus, a season of Easter, the season of Holy Spirit, one day, Pentecost. Then go away. Let's get into ordinary time. The Spirit is something that is challenging and scary and absolutely necessary for life to be what God calls it to be. We are constantly called to breathe new life into the creation of our souls and the body of Christ. New life means change. New life means doing things differently. 
I had a conversation this last week of, of somebody who was challenged, uh, challenged by in the life of the body of Christ by another person who didn't want to change. Invoking those words, famous seven last words of the church, we've always done it this way before. It's not possible to do things the way they were always done. Several years ago, I attended, along with 6,000 of my closest friends, a week of activities with Rick Warren at Saddleback Church in Southern California in Orange County. Rick Warren wrote The Purpose Driven Church and The Purpose Driven Life. Um, Rick's theology stinks. Rick's methodology is spot on. And what he told us at the beginning of this, of this journey was that what we are about to give you is the 2% that works because we tried the other 98% that didn't as well. What he also said was that in any particular congregation, 70% of what you are doing is no longer effective because it is tied to a previous time that no longer works. And only 30% of what you're doing is, is, is really real and effective. And he's saying that's true for almost all churches all across the American and, and global landscape. That's something that's a that we really have to think about. What's the 70% that we're doing that doesn't work? What's the 30% that does? What are we as a body being challenged by to grow into the next generations and to do so effectively that we're not now doing? The Spirit of the Lord is upon us and has come into us to breathe new life into us. We don't want to choke on it. We want to take it in. How can we do that? One of the things that I, I greatly admire about Rick's um, overarching methodology is that he talks about purpose-drivenness. And to get to the point of how we do that, we turn to our second scripture from the New Testament about what happened when Lazarus was raised from the dead, another resurrection passion, pass, uh, passage. If you look at that particular passage, all 48 verses, it is a very emotion-filled, passion-filled piece of Scripture on the part of what happens in Jesus. The passage contains the shortest verse of the Scripture. Jesus wept in John 11. Jesus was crying over the loss, over the loss of his friend Lazarus. Now you could very easily say, well, except he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. What was the big deal? What did it take to raise Lazarus from the dead? It took a, fee that, a connectedness with God's Spirit and a feeling of passion that was able to take what was dead and turn it back to life. So in the life of the body of Christ, as you look at you know, the things that happen in a purpose-driven church, what's your passion? What is your passion, my brothers and sisters? What is your passion for God? What is your passion for Christ? What is your passion for what happens in the life of the body of Christ? What is your passion? What do you feel strongly about, about what should happen about here? Let's talk in terms of what is important to you. And, of course, in terms of what is important to you, some are going to say, well, it's important to me to keep things as the way they were as much as possible. It could be that some of the traditions we have here are important, to important enough to keep. I don't know if we want to be in a congregational life where we don't have communion every Sunday. Or fabulous sermons. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Um, what is important? What grows us in the Spirit of God? Resurrection stories. My favorite quote about resurrection is from uh, my favorite author, who is Father Andrew Greeley, Jesuit priest, and he said, Resurrection? It ain't supposed to be easy. And it's not. 
To breathe new life into things requires a commitment and a power and a passion to take what was dead and bring it back to life again. Any of you done that lately? Oh, boy. And actually, some of you have. Some of you have healed relationships. Some of you have turned down from old ways and moved into new ways that have revitalized your souls. In the life of the body of Christ, what is new, as Christ says, I make all things new, is what we're called to look at and do and follow. My brothers and sisters, are we going to be dead bones in a valley? Or are we going to be the people of God moving forth in God's spirit to everlasting life? Think about what you are each called to do and what we as a body are called to do together. In the name of the Creator and the Savior and the Sustainer. Amen.